Take your Bible this morning and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses uh, 13 through 18. The topic is the rapture. I've called it various ta things. I've called it the rapture question. I've called it the blessed hope or our blessed hope, but uh, we're going to be looking at the rapture. Uh, often we'll hear somebody talk about the coming of the Lord. And when that is preached, we wonder, is he talking about Christ's second coming? Is he talking about the rapture? Is the rapture and the second coming the same event? Or are they different events? And sometimes we'll hear somebody uh, say, well, uh, the coming of the Lord has two phases. It has, first of all, the rapture, and then it has the second coming. And uh, often it's confusing to us. And the people of Thessalonica were rather confused as well because uh, Paul had taught them much doctrine. He had taught them about uh, salvation. He had talked to them about how to live. He had talked to them about uh, sanctification, the rapture, the day of the Lord, the Antichrist, and apostasy and the second coming. And so he taught them about all this, and then he had also taught them, as 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 says, that they should wait for his Son from heaven, who will deliver them from the wrath to come. Now the problem is, uh, some of the believers in Thessalonica had died. And uh, so the... The believers that were alive had a lot of questions. What's going to happen to these people? Uh, had they missed, really, the rapture, the reunion, the kingdom? Had they missed uh, the reign of Christ? And uh, Paul did not want to, for them to be confused. He wanted them to have assurance that, no, they had not missed the rapture. And there are a lot of people confused today on the rapture. When I wrote my article for Israel My Glory on the rapture, I got a lot of questions. People said, thank you for making it clear. Thank you for answering this question that I have had for a long time. And so uh, we cleared up questions for them. But there are voices out there that are denying the rapture today. And some are saying, well, it's been 2,000 years since this uh, promise was uh, given and uh, the Lord hasn't returned. Well, I don't want us to be confused and we should know exactly what the text says. And I'll say this about the rapture. It is a dateless event. It is a signless event and it is a timeless event. We say that the rapture is imminent. It could happen at any moment. There is no prophecy that need be fulfilled. And so I have uh, seven truths that I want to share with you concerning the rapture of the church. Now the first uh, truth that I want to give you is the reminder to the church in verses 13 through 15. Uh, Paul, first of all, talks about those who have passed on. He talks about sleeping saints. And he says, I wouldn't have you to be ignorant concerning them who are asleep. Now, he's not rebuking them. He's wanting to inform them so that they will have proper knowledge on the rapture of the church. And uh, the word uh, sleep is a euphemism for death. And so when you see this word sleep in the scripture, it's talking about death. And uh, there's no such thing as soul sleep as some would teach in society today. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8 says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And uh, Paul says over in uh, chapter 5, verse 10 of this book, whether we wake or sleep, we will live together with Christ. And you remember uh, the rich man and Lazarus both died. And in Luke chapter 16, we have the rich man 
who uh, was very conscious, and he was in Hades, and he could feel, he could think, he could talk, and so uh, consciousness after you have passed from this life is very real. There's no such thing as soul sleep. And you'll remember over in Revelation chapter uh, 6, verses 9 through 11, the opening of the fifth seal saw souls that were clothed under the altar, and uh, they were very conscious in that state. So there's no such thing as soul sleeping. The second thing he wants to remind the church of here is that they shouldn't be sorrowing saints in verse 13. It says, Sorrow not as others who have no hope. And there is a place for uh, the sorrowing of a loved one that goes on to be with the Lord. But uh, I've met people that continually sorrow over a loved one. I say, huh, when did they pass? And the person says, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And uh, so they're still sorrowing. And this is a command here in verse 13. Paul says, stop doing something you're doing. Stop sorrowing. Prolonged sorrow is unnatural for a loved one who knew the Lord and went on to be with the Lord. And you'll remember what the Apostle Paul said over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57. He says, death has lost its sting. It's been removed for the believer. The grave's victory has been destroyed. And he says that we do have victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's telling the church here to stop sorrowing over those who have passed on. Then there's a third uh, point that he wants to bring out here in verse 14. He wants to give them solace. He says uh, in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And uh, he's, he's, he's writing it in uh, the English here as though it is a doubt, that we're doubting whether uh, we believe that Christ died and rose again. But this little uh, word, if, uh, really, you can write above it, since. He's really saying, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And so what he is saying here is there is hope. And there is hope in Christ. Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. And if there's first fruit, that means other fruit is going to come afterwards. And so he's giving assurance of their resurrection, and it's assurance to us of our resurrection as well. So, uh, yes, amen. We're going to be resurrected someday. So absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, after he reminds the church, the second point that I want to bring out is the reappearance of Christ in verse 16. Now notice, it's going to be personal. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout. And so it's going to be the Lord, not somebody else. His same Lord Jesus taken up from you into heaven, Acts chapter 1, verse 11. It's going to come in like manner as you have seen him gone. It's not going to be somebody else coming back. It's going to be the Lord. So he's personally coming back. And uh, you'll notice the procedure here in verse 16. There are three things that are mentioned concerning the procedure. There's going to be the shout. Now this is a command again. And uh, I think I can best illustrate this as uh, when I was in the army. And I took uh, my uh, basic training down at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and we had to fall out, and the drill sergeant, sharp and pressed, standing tall, 
with that uh, hat on that uh, and spoke with authority, he would come forth and he wanted you to fall in line. He said, hey, what? And he would shout it out. And you had to snap to attention. Well, this is a command. That's what it is here. It's going to be a shout like you were ordering troops at attention. And what kind of shout is it going to be? We don't know exactly, but it'll be a, a shout with authority. Now, uh, there's going to be the voice of the archangel as well. And uh, this is not Gabriel because he's not an archangel. This is Michael the archangel. And Michael is called an archangel in Jude 9. And so we know this is going to be Michael. And then there's going to be the trump of God. And um, it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number uh, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now this says the last trump. Some want to say, well, this is at the end, uh, you know, of the tribulation, the last trump there, there uh, before Christ comes. Now it can't be that trump. Some want to say, well, it's uh, one of the trumps uh, mentioned in the book of Revelation. Can't be that trump, because that's not the last trump. Uh, some want to say, well, uh, you know, uh, it'll be the last trump uh, mentioned in Matthew 24, verse 31, for uh, there you have a trumpet after the second coming of the Lord. But that is a, a trumpet that the elect mentioned in Matthew 24 are going to hear, and that is for those who are Jewish people, I believe. I think the last trump here is the last trump that the church is going to hear. And when that trump sounds, uh, then we have the, uh, you have the shout, the voice of the archangel, trump of God. And uh, so all believers are out of here in their glorified body and taken to heaven. So I believe it's the last trump that the uh, church is going to hear. And... Uh, then we're gone. Some want to roll all these together in one sound, like it's uh, a shout, voice of the archangel, trump of God happens all one time. Well, we don't know how it's going to happen. We just know that it is given here, and at that time, we are gone. The uh, third point that I want to bring out this morning is the rapture of the church. Now, the... Uh, word rapture is not found in the Bible. And some want to say, well, since the word rapture is not found in the Bible, then that means that uh, there's no such thing as a rapture. That's what some theologian made up. Well, it's very interesting. Uh, when you look down at verse number 17, it says here, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The word uh, here, caught up, in the Greek language is harpazo, and it means to be forcibly seized, to be carried off, to be snatched away. Now, if you were to go and uh, look at this word uh, in the Latin language, that's where the word raptuo comes from. And that's where the rapture comes. So, so when you're talking about the rapture, you're really speaking about the uh, forcibly being seized away, caught up, uh, snatched away, and they mean the same thing. So though the word rapture is not found in the Bible, the concept is there. And when you go to the Greek language, uh, rapture and harpazo mean the same thing, caught away. Now, uh, how fast is the rapture going to happen? Well, I read a few moments ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, and uh, we sa saw there it's going to happen in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. 
That word moment in Greek language where we get our word atom. It's a very small particle minutia of anything. And the twinkling of an eye, how fast does light travel? 186,000 miles a second. At least that's what I learned in school. And uh, that's fast, pretty fast. So you see the, uh, out of my glasses here, the light. If we were to turn the light on, the moment uh, lights turn on, you'd see it reflected in my glasses. That happens very, very quickly. Or if you're not wearing glasses in the pupil of your eye, you could see the light reflected. So uh, it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, there's a debate on what a twinkling of an eye means by some people. But uh, I think what it's trying to relate here, it's so fast, you're not even going to know it happened. And uh, so when you hear the shout, voice of the archangel, trump of God, we're out of here. You're gone. This, that fast. Somebody says, well, I'll have time to prepare for the rapture. Brother, sister, you're either prepared or you're not prepared because we are out of here just that fast. And so it's going to be us, and amen. And it happens that fast. Now, um, that's how fast it's going to happen. But uh, if you look at verse 16, it says here, the resurrection, the dead in Christ will rise first. They are the ones that are going to come forth. And what happens, and a lot of people are confused about this about the soul and spirit coming back and being reunited with the physical body. And when I wrote the ra uh, article on the rapture, I received uh, questions on this. Just how does this all work? Well, you see, when you die, your soul and spirit go to heaven, but your body goes to the grave. And then at the rapture, what happens is the soul and spirit come back and reunite with the body and just that quick, you are in your glorified state. That's the change mentioned over in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. We're changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now, it says the dead in Christ. Uh, uh, this is not the Old Testament saints. And I know some people disagree with me, and I've gotten questions on this. This is speaking about those in Christ, and it's the church that is in Christ. Oh, true, Old Testament saints are uh, believers, and they're going to receive a glorified body as well. But in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it talks about a resurrection taking place, uh, and this uh, is speaking about Israelis, I believe. And uh, or Old Testament saints, I should say. And uh, uh, it, told, it said in verse 13 of that chapter that Daniel was going to stand in his lot in the latter days. So I believe we're talking about a resurrection of Old Testament believers, but not at the same time that the church is going to be resurrected and receive their glorified body. So they're going to be resurrected as well, have a glorified body. You say, well, when does that happen? I believe it happens just before the second coming of the Lord. Uh, they're going to receive their resurrected body. Now, uh, it says that uh, we're going to rise who are alive, verse 17. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Now, that could happen at any time, and it might happen today, or it might happen 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Uh, we don't know when it's going to happen, but there should be that expectation. Now, Paul is writing here, and if you'll notice in verse 17, he says here, we who are alive, he puts himself in that bunch. So he was looking for the rapture of the church in his day. We who are alive. And I believe he, he thought it could happen then. And so uh, this is the great event that's going to take place. Can you imagine having a glorified body? Well, we're going to get into that in just a minute, but... Uh, 
We're going to have glorified bodies. Fourth point that I want you to see here is in verse 17, and that's the reuniting of the church. The reuniting of the church. The people, in verse 17, caught up together in the clouds. From whatever age people who are believers lived, they're all, the whole church is going to be caught up to meet the Lord in their glorified bodies. And the person we're going to meet, look at verse 17, meet the Lord in the air. Uh, and this really in classical Greek was a ceremonial meeting. It was like you're going to meet a new magistrate coming uh, into an area. It was a ceremonial meeting, and that's what it's going to be when we meet the Lord. And notice, it's going to be permanent, verse 17, ever be with the Lord. And it says here, we, all believers, how long ever, forever be with the Lord? That means for eternity we're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the place we are going to be is found over in John chapter 14 in verses 2 through 3. You know, the Lord said to his disciples that were very troubled and he was going away. And uh, uh, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where you are, there, where I am, there will you be also. And so the idea here is he's got a mansion prepared uh, for us. It's really uh, a dwelling place in heaven. And notice in verse 2, it's a prepared place. I go to prepare a place for you. And he's saying, not collectively for you, but for you, for you, for you, for you. You're a believer. He's preparing a special place for you in heaven. And uh, he's going to come back and personally escort us to that place. I come again, receive you unto myself. Wow, there's just so many points that you could bring out here about what's going to take place when we are raptured away. And it's exciting to read here in what Paul is writing and what Jesus said before his death and resurrection. So there's going to be a great uniting of the church and be taken to heaven, which is a prepared place for us. The fifth point that I want to bring out is uh, our resurrected change. The resurrected change that's going to take place. Now I read uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. We shall all be changed. And what's that change going to be like? Well, we have some indication, but there are points that, well, we'd like to have a little more clarity on or more revelation. But let me, uh, best I can do is give you what I call the A, B, C of our resurrection change. Now, the A, I say appearance. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says that in the appearance we're going to be fashioned like his glorious body. You want to know what uh, glorious body we're going to have? Well, uh you um, got to look at the Lord's glorious body. Now, I got a few more years on me, and uh, as you are watching this video, you can see that uh, I'm not a guy in his 20s or 30s, and I've wondered what my change is going to be like. What am I going to look like at that time? Well, I don't know. I guess it's going to maximize what our beauty and glorification would be in our glorified body. But I can tell you this, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be better than the bodies we have right now. And uh, then it says, body raised incorruptible. It's going to be perfected, perfect. It's going to be prepared for eternity. Now, uh, 
I got up today and I had a backache and my leg was bothering me a, a little bit today. And I laid out on the floor and I did a few exercises to straighten everything and hear everything pop back in place. So I can stand pretty straight and tall now. But as we age, we know we got the headaches, all oh, these headaches, we got back aches, we got plenty of other aches. But in that day, it's all gone, perfection. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to have a perfect body and a perfect mind? And so uh, we're going to have a perfect body. And then the C is we're going to have certain capacities. And it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, we're going to be like Him, like the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you want to know what some of your capacities might be? We're going to be like Him, but we're not going to have all that He has, I don't believe. But we're going to be like Him. And, uh, you know, He could appear and disappear. Luke chapter 24, verse 31 thought transfer, he would be in one place, he would uh, think about being another place, he would just be there. Um, physical likeness, he could, the scars were still in his uh, body. I don't, we're going to have a perfect body, I don't know quite what that all means. He could walk, he could talk, he could eat, and he could uh, rise, and he was in a glorified body. So when you get down, you, you wonder about it all, uh, don't lose the wonder of it all. There's a, a little chorus that goes, I've never lost the wonder of it all. Since the day that Jesus saved me, a whole new life he gave me, I've never lost the wonder of it all. Don't lose the wonder of the glorified body. You're saved in Christ. You're alive in Christ. One day you'll be resurrected in a glorified body. Think of the wonders that that will be and uh, just glory in that till that day comes. Well, the sixth point that I want to bring out uh, this morning is um, rapture confusion. Oh, a lot of rapture confusion out there. There are five positions I just want to briefly mention without going in depth to them. And if you're watching this video and you have a question of what it all means, and you can write uh, to the Friends of Israel or you can email us uh, over our website and we can go into further depth on what this all means. But there are five uh, possible positions that people put out there concerning the rapture. Some want to say, first of all, a partial rapture. And what they're saying, only those who are waiting, watching, worthy, worshiping the Lord, they're going to be raptured away. Only them. You got to be ready, prayed up, prayed through, as uh, some people want to say. I don't find that as being biblical. It says, all in Christ. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no such thing as a partial rapture. <clears throat> then there's the mid-trib uh, uh, rapture position. Uh, it says that, uh, true, there's going to be during the tribulation wrath poured out upon the earth, but this is man's wrath against man, and... Uh, it's not uh, God's wrath. We are going to be raptured after about three and a half years of this time. And before the great uh, tribulation, the day of the Lord takes place. Well, um, that does away with imminency. We say the rapture is imminent. It could happen at any moment. And so uh, I don't see that a mid-trib rapture position is really viable. Uh, remember when Lord, the Lord in, in Revelation chapter 5 took the seals, the seal scroll, and he opened them. Uh, he opened all of them, and the seal judgments were from God's wrath upon mankind as well. It wasn't just man's wrath upon man. It was God's wrath. So I don't see the mid-trib rapture position as being viable. 
And then there's the pre-wrath rapture position, which says that the church is going to go through the tribulation till the time of the day of the Lord and then be raptured away uh, just before the day of the Lord uh, is a tribulation poured on the face of the earth. Uh, I don't believe that that's a true position either. For those of you who are watching the video, if you would like a book, we have a book uh, that we offer here at Friends of Israel uh, called The Pre-Wrath Rapture Critiqued by uh, Dr. Reynolds Showers. And he goes point by point through this position and shows how it's not a true position scripturally. And then the, um, the fourth uh, position is a post-tribulation rapture. Say the church goes through the tribulation and is raptured at the end of the tribulation to meet the Lord in the air. And uh, I don't see that, uh, that uh, position being true either. For, you know, uh, we're the bride of Christ. And if we're the bride of Christ, Christ loves his bride. And would you pour out your wrath upon your new bride? I think not. I don't think we would do that. And what did uh, Paul tell us in Thessalonians? We are going to escape the wrath that's coming. Chapter 1, verse 10 again. And in chapter 5, verse 10, he says, We are not appointed unto wrath. So uh, we're not going through the tribulation. And the fifth position is uh, a pre-tribulation rapture position. And that teaches that the church will be raptured away before Daniel's 70th week begins. And um, <clears throat> I believe this is what the true position is of the teaching of Scripture. A pre-tribulation rapture. We're delivered from the wrath to come again. We're not appointed unto wrath. We say that the uh, rapture is imminent. It can happen at any time. There's no prophecy that need be fulfilled for this to take place. And uh, if you look at uh, the tribulation, Revelation chapter 4 through chapter 18, you will see that the uh, church is not mentioned once there as suffering during this time. The, sir, the church is not there. And then in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, um, John was writing and said that uh, that church, the church of Philadelphia, was uh, kept from the hour of temptation, or really means tribulation there in the text, that's what it's saying. And it means to keep or to guard or preserve from. The little Greek uh, word ek, from, means that we're going to be kept out of ever going into uh, this time of tribulation. He was promising that to the church of, Phil uh, of Philadelphia. And uh, the hour, that's a specific period of time. And then again, temptation or literally tribulation, it says. And uh, so I do not think that he was just only telling the church at Philadelphia this. I think it's speaking concerning those that would come after as well. This is much broader than just that specific time. And then again, the 70th week of Daniel, uh, it's uh, determined upon thy people Israel, not the church. So I, uh, I just don't see that we are going to have to go through any tribulation. So... Uh, these five positions, I believe it's the pre-tribulation rapture. And this is what Paul is trying to emphasize to the Thessalonians. Now the seventh point, and that's the reader to be comforted. And this is uh, what it says in verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, the word comfort means to encourage one another. 
build one another up in the faith on this subject. And it's a command. It's a present imperative. And Paul is saying to the church then, and he's saying to us too, it is our continual duty in private and in public to really uh, encourage one another that look for the time that the Lord is coming back to rapture us away. And um, it's to be in our conversation. Notice it says here, these words. He means to remind one another of our blessed hope in the words. I've just written to you in these verses. And so uh, he's saying, reader, I'm comforting you. He takes them from uh, reminding them what he said and then ends with comfort. Now, in these few verses, verses 13 through 18, if you were to read chapter 4, verses 1 through 12 of 1 Thessalonians, and then you would bridge over to chapter 5, you notice it talks about Christian living and Christians, how they're to order their life in their Christian living to one another and in their church life. And what he is saying here. We are to be living for the Lord. And then he puts in between these things the rapture passage. So he's talking about being prepared, living for the Lord. And that time could happen at any moment. Well, um, how do you put all this together then? Uh, uh, somebody has um, written on a tombstone in England these words and you've probably heard this before but I just think it needs emphasis uh, the phrase that was etched on that uh, tombstone was pause my friend as you walk by as you are now so once was I as I am now so you will be prepare my friend to Follow me. Well, I've already got my tombstone, and I'm still here, but I haven't etched anything on it yet. We have a, a disagreement of what we want to put on our tombstone, <laughs> and my wife and I. And I'm still here, so uh, that's, a, that's a good statement to get your attention, but somebody wrote under that, to follow you is not my intent until I see which way you went. And so, which way are you going? Well, you know the Left Behind series that was very popular. Uh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins wrote the Left Behind series. Some of you have read the books. Um, are you prepared or are you going to be left behind? And that's a question. Well, everything that I've been saying today um, applies to us who are born again, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you do not know him, uh, you're going to be left behind. Now, Jim Showers is going to come, and he's going to bring two messages on the time of the tribulation, what's going to happen. And as you listen... If you don't know the Lord Jesus, you're left behind and you're going to go through that time that Jim is talking about. I don't know about you, my friend, but if I didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I'd want to put faith in him. I'd want to come and know him for sure. And Friends of Israel stands by to help you and counsel you and show you how you can know the Lord Jesus Christ. You can call us. You can write us. You can email us. And if you're uncertain, let us know. We're here to help you. Well, uh, the rapture. What have we said today? Well, there are four things we've said. We said, what is really the rapture? It uh, takes the Christian to heaven at the Lord's timing. When will it occur? It's going to occur before the seven-year period of the tribulation. Who will it affect? 
It's going to affect all Christians, whether dead or alive at that time. They're all caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And why will it occur? It's going to occur to deliver us from the wrath to come. And uh, if you're sitting here today or listening to that tape, I say perhaps today, come Lord Jesus, we're ready for him to come and to snatch us or catch us away to be with himself.